Okay, so we, we're looking at, at the, the solutions to marine waste. The issues that we're facing um, are, are, are quite problematic, and we need to look at future options and uh, solutions and technologies that will resolve the marine waste issues in developing countries. So a quick overview of who I am. I'm the managing director of uh, a nonprofit organization based in KwaZulu-Natal. We're called Use It. Use It is the Etiquini Waste Materials Recovery Industry Development Cluster, uh, and we work in conjunction with the, the uh, Etiquini Municipality, or the Durban Metro. We were established in July 2009 as a nonprofit uh, company, specifically with aims to identify waste beneficiation uh, that will increase diversion from landfall, creating opportunities and green economic growth, and specifically looking at maximizing job creation opportunities in doing so. So we're a multi-award winning company. We've won um, uh, awards for innovation in waste at local, national, and international level, uh, including the, the light, latest two, which were the Chartered Institutes of Waste Management uh, in London in 2017, and the World Circular Economy Forum, uh, also in 2017. And through the work that we've done, and we look at all the different waste streams, we've created uh, nearly 2,600 jobs um, to date in the last nine years. And on average, we're saving the city about five times the funding that we receive in landfill diversion costs. Um, and that's based on the Etiquini model, which is at 300 rand a cubic meter. And on top of that, we leverage about 10 times that investment in external funds for project development, which essentially gives us a 1,500% return uh, to our funders on average. So uh, I think that's obviously why we have been nominated for quite a number of awards. But what are we doing here? Um, so today is really looking about some of the issues we're facing in, uh, in the third world. Uh, developing countries have a massive, massive problem with regards to waste and waste management. And the issues relate largely to um, the, the lack or, or um, the, the, the poor service delivery we have with regards to waste management, waste management opportunities, proper landfill, uh, collection, transportation, and uh, management of waste. And South Africa is not alone. If you go to any African country, uh, it doesn't matter where you go, I think perhaps with the exception of Rwanda, which are doing some amazing things at the moment, um, we see waste all, over, all across our environment, and largely that is getting into the, um, in, into the river environment, and that ultimately gets into the ocean environment. The picture at the bottom left is that of um, the Citroen River in Indonesia, and uh, there's, there's a number of uh, um, problems that are a lot more exacerbated than the ones that we have. Um, the, the Citroen River is, is renowned as the most polluted river in the world, and yet they're looking at massive applications for cleaning up the waste, um, but then they've still got to landfill it afterwards. So we have massive problems with beach cleanups and river cleanups, and we end up with what we call cleanup uh, apathy or cleanup lethargy, where people get sick and tired eventually of just picking the stuff up, and every time it rains, the rivers and the, the oceans are full again. But what we've got to realize is that this is not just a third world problem. This is a global problem. And these are some of the pictures that uh, we see from across the world. The one at the top is the beaches in Hawaii. Um, and this is largely from uh, ocean currents bringing waste from other countries into, on, onto the beaches in Hawaii. And similarly for Norway. Norway have a very high level of uh, waste and waste management, and yet they are continuously cleaning up their beaches. And the Americans uh, will even uh, claim the same issue, but uh, if you look at this picture from California, you'll see that most of the river, most of the waste is uh, being caught in a litter boom coming down the river towards the ocean, and, and certainly not on the ocean. So there is no single country that is without blame, but obviously the impacts are massive globally. And what we're going to try and do is, uh, although use it works in uh, applications right across the different waste streams, we're going to focus on plastics today. And plastics are always seen as the as the as the, um, as the, as the naughty child. And you know we work nationally with the likes of SA Plastics and others. And I think everyone understands that plastics aren't really the problem. Uh, it's the management of that 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 is the issue. 
um, you know, we need to look at, at other issues around uh, the design and, and recyclability issues. But uh, plastics are a major problem. And what we can do is we can prevent plastics. So we can say no to plastics. And that is in the hands of the consumer. Each consumer has the ability to um, manage their own lifestyles and what they, they are doing as, as consumers. Um, but the reality is, is that this is not really going to happen. You can't say no to plastics. Plastics are prevalent in every single thing we do in life. I'm sitting here in front of a computer that's 90% plastic with earphones that are plastic and a mouse that's plastic and my cell phone is largely plastic. Um, there are so many different components of our life um, that are dominated by plastics. But we can't say no to plastics. That's the simple reality. Um, if we look at what's happening internationally right now, the investment that's happened globally uh, in the last decade has put in nearly $200 billion worth of investment into increasing plastic production. So we're looking at, at over the next decade, an estimated 40% increase in plastics production. And that's done. That's a done deal. That's basically happening right now. The investments have gone in. And yet these same companies who've invested 200 billion um, have maybe put aside uh, about a billion dollars to look at cleaning up the problem and so solving issues. Um, so it really is paying lip service to an issue. And, and uh, the reality is, is that we can't expect uh, governments alone or industries alone or consumers alone to tackle this problem. We need to look at this um, together. These are not made up numbers. So if you look at any number of quotations, just Google it about the increase in plastic production over the next decade, and you will see multiple different uh, references to the same thing. So the problem's not going away. We need to find the solutions. One of those is reduction. Um, so we can reduce the amount of plastic, and, and there's certain things we can do, like with uh, single-use plastics. We can ban uh, we can ban plastic bags. Um, obviously, there are certain people who believe that is one of the best options, and I don't know if Haley's on the line, um, but uh, yeah, I see her name there. So Haley will be going, yes, thank you. We want to ban the plastic bag. Absolutely, we need to look at other opportunities there. Um, but we also need to look at designing better. And a lot of this, if you look at the slide or, or the, the figure on the right, we're seeing that um, uh, in the last 20 years or so, EcoShare bottles, and this is a Nestle product, have gone from 23.9 uh, grams to 9.2 grams per bottle. And the plastic companies are saying, look how great we are. We're saving the environment. We're using less plastic. Unfortunately, this really is a one-way street. This benefits the packaging industry. So the packaging industry is actually getting the same product out for less price. Uh, and then using it to claim how green they are. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't matter if the plastic is thinner, as you'll see by the bottom picture, it's still going to kill a turtle. So we need to be able to look at um, uh, changing this dynamic. What we're seeing also in terms of a greenwashing side of things, which is good and bad in certain ways. So there's big companies, there's a big shoe company that, that says that they're manufacturing shoes from ocean waste. And yes, it's a great thing. What it does is it raises awareness. Um, but the reality is, is that there's an awful lot more plastic out there than, than there are shoes. And uh, it's not going to solve the problem, but it does add a voice to the issue and it, and it does start to show some level of um, corporate responsibility. The reality is, is, I don't know about you lot, but I certainly couldn't afford a pair of those shoes. Um, there's other companies that are doing it for sunglasses and say, look what we're doing. We're making um, sustainable sunglasses out of ocean plastics. And um, this is all great. But again, those are not sunglasses that I can afford. So we're talking about high LSM applications, um, which we can look at uh, um, for, from certain applications. Um, so where's the waste coming from? And we do have a clue in terms of this. Um, Prof Jambeck and a number of other uh, investigators have done a lot of work. Um, we know um, that Africa and Asia are the problem children. And uh, we know that, that uh, through the likes of the World Economic Forum, um, a number of research um, uh, papers have been done with regard to the source of this plastic. And, and we've seen uh, that about 95% of all the plastic entering our oceans every year 
uh, is shown to come from 100 rivers across Africa and Asia. And the problem is, is uh, if you look at, at, for example, one uh, river alone in China, the Yangtze River is responsible for around 40% of the um, uh, 40 percent of the of the waste going into the oceans. Now we know how to, again to collect that. So systems, River Recycle, and other international groups have looked at systems where they are able to collect that waste um, using flotation devices and other um, unique innovations that will scoop the the waste from the river. But again, what do you do once you've got it? It's largely contaminated. Your recyclers don't want it, um, and it becomes a problem in terms of the, the further management of that. And, and is that going to get into a proper managed landfill, or is it going to once again end up in our oceans? So in Africa, when we talk about these higher LSM things like nice shoes and sunglasses, these are not issues that are of relevance realistically to the developing countries. We need key elements that, that are problems in developing countries. We need education, we need health, we need infrastructure, jobs, food, energy. These are all components which are vital to the further development and growth of the developing countries. So in terms of the way forward for Africa, what we need to do is we need to put away that begging bowl. We've got to stop looking to the first world to bail us out of the problem. Um, there's a lot of in innovations and solutions locally. Uh, and also, there's a lot of expensive and costly um, innovations one can purchase from, from Europe or the States or Australia or wherever else where um, they claim to have solutions to our problems. They don't necessarily work in, the, in, in developing economies. Um, waste to energy is a prime example. Absolutely. Should we have it as part of our, our mix in the country? Yes. The complications of that are far more... Um, cantankerous than, than one would believe. So when one starts looking at producing energy, one's got to deal with ESCOM and issues of IPPs and PPAs. One has to deal with municipalities and look at sovereign guarantees over 25 years to guarantee um, uh, the investment. There are problems with the, the fact that waste energy is largely both um, heat and electricity, and we don't have a large heat market in this country, which means that we lose half that value. And then we try and compare a highly expensive waste energy facility for a metropolitan area that would run to the tune of 150 to 170 million dollars that um, overseas is often paid back purely from the level of uh, landfill taxes and high landfill rates that will um, uh, basically offset that cost. The UK is a prime example where landfill is in the region of 77 pounds a ton, but on top of that, you're paying 86 pounds 40 a ton landfill tax. But if you take it to a waste energy plant, you're only paying a gate fee of 50 pounds a ton. So what that 50 pounds a ton does is pays off the capex and the working capital um, for that equipment. We don't have the same luxury and resources in this country. So the third point there is that we really do have substantially different socioeconomic dynamics. And we don't have the structures and the resources and the systems of the first world. Um, so we've got to look at um, trying to uh, understand the needs for Africa using our own desire, skills, and innovative abilities to drive solutions that are going to work for Africa. And we need to unlock the value chain. We need to valorize different waste products in order to create products that we need in Africa to cater for our rapidly expanding population. And if you look at the population dynamics, um, the bulk of the population uh, growth over the next 20 years is going to be in Africa and Asia. And this needs to be driven through green procurement and local production. How do we drive these different components um, through, uh, through, through working with government and, and corporates with regard to procurement and local production? So let's take out some of those different issues. I mean, things like education. Um, often, you know, people say, "Well, what's recycling got to do with education?" Well, actually, there's uh, quite a quite a bit that can be done there. Um, if one looks at early childhood development, the reality is that 80% of a child's brain potential, in terms of uh, numeracy and, and literacy levels, is developed by the age of four. And if we are not um, 
growing that brain at that early phase. You know, what we're trying to do in terms of providing free education at tertiary level is, is literally trying to shoot the horse once it's bolted. So we've got to look at, at applications. And there's some great organizations, Single Quenza based in, in the Midlands, um, show daycare centers how to look at using waste for, for education tools. And then we can also look at uh, how waste can be involved in health and nutrition and food security. And there's projects that we're uh, working on. We work very closely with a, with a company called Umgibe. Um, and they use waste resources to build uh, agricultural um, structures that uh, create organic food and opportunities for entrepreneurship, uh, food security, and also food processing. Uh, when we look at, at the, the recycling component of that, obviously we can look at nutrient recycling when one's processing the vegetables. Uh, one can recycle those through vermiculture and composting operations and create closed loop opportunities that will um, impact on health and nutrition. And again, uh, Haley, uh, there's a good use for your, for your plastic bags, um, but we are trying to work on something different. Um, the ladies from Amgibe just recently went over to India uh, looking at banana plantation waste for developing woven bags as a replacement to the plastic bags. So we're not, we're not sold on just plastic bags. They were just the quickest and easiest to, to look at at the time. But the perception of recycling is always one that I have a problem with. We have a very naive view of recycling in, in, in Africa and, and, and Asia. Um, we all see these things, any of us uh, who've got kids who've been to primary school, they somebody's going to come back with a, with a milk bottle that's been, in, been turned into an elephant. I still have my youngest daughter's one hanging up in uh, my dining room, gathering more dust than I would care to see. But, uh, uh, you know, these are uh, issues that one sees in terms of saying, well, you know, is this recycling? It's not recycling. It, it, it's, it's craft work. We need to look at realistic applications. And realistic applications come into some of the work that user does. One of these, for example, is uh, we keep talking about plastics being the bad boy. Um, plastics and, and uh, recyclables. So if you look at plastics, paper, cardboard, uh, tins, metals, etc., they only contribute about 25% of our landfill. But up to 40% of our landfill is actually soil waste and builder's rubble. Um, and nothing's done with that. There's no extended producer responsibility being discussed. Who's responsible? And the cement production companies pay nothing in terms of looking at, at um, the, their responsibility for the products they're putting into the market. And yet there are solutions. So, you know, if one literally turned around and changed the procurement processes and said that um, we need to be able to um, put into our procurement that 30% of all new roads developed will have at least 30% crushed builder's rubble in there, we would find a market offtake for the 7.2 million tons of rubble we put into our landfill sites every year, very, very quickly. Um, and, and it's certainly an application. But even like the Rambrick, we've developed a system using soil, because soil is also a massive problem, as big as um, uh, rubble. And 70% soil, 25% rubble going into our, into our landfill sites uh, or into our blocks produces a highly efficient um, compressed earth block. And, and there are multiple applications that we're looking at with different waste streams and different opportunities. But coming back to the housing side of things, so let's look at a big market application. We need to create markets that are not looking at the sort of your small upcycled type product. We find very limited markets for those. Let's look at products which are replacing conventional products. And the building industry is an ideal opportunity for that because a huge amount of resources goes into the built environment. So if we look at um, uh, plastic and sand uh, going into roof tiles, um, there's a great opportunity in terms of alternative roof tile manufacture. There's a Canadian company doing fantastic slate looking tiles out of tires. We can use our local uh, glass that we throw away uh, millions of tons of glass in this country and use that for glass counters and uh, working counters and, and other uh, product manufacture. We've developed systems for uh, problematic e-waste um, plastics, which uh, can produce gutters and guttering systems. Um, the HDPE from plastic bags and everything can go into the production of piping and conduits that can be used for electrics and, and plumbing in housing. 
Um, glass can also go into wood insula uh, wool insulation, which becomes a, uh, a thermal um, a product for between um, uh, double brick walls or around geyser blankets, that sort of thing. And massive opportunity again for insulation. So there's a whole host of things one can manufacture from different waste products to unlock the value that would replace conventional products. The issue is about creating the markets and looking at the compliance and ensuring that we have the uh, certification and uh, compliance that, that uh, um, would get these products into the conventional markets. We have a number of problems there with the likes of uh, SABS. Um, in the building industry, they complicate it further through the uh, Algramar certification, uh, National Home Builders Regulation Council, CIDB, uh, now you've got the IPCC and the GBSA playing in the same space as well as the DTI and everyone's running around trying to look at it but all they're really doing is complicating it instead of saying let's just use these things in the market. So there's a number of different products we can manufacture as well. Um, many of you have seen these. There's a whole bunch of furniture. There's a whole host of people out there doing timber plastics that, that can be manufactured into different products and those can build social infrastructure um, and uh, just hold on two seconds. Sorry, I'm just trying to get rid of some of the background noise here. Um, so there's a number of different products that we can manufacture that could replace conventional products and, and replace things like timber, plastic fencing, uh, plastic pavers, uh, blocks, boardwalks, plastic fencing. There's a huge amount of different uh, products that can be can be manufactured from these these different um, uh, materials and these are not unique these have been around for a while so we just need to make sure that we can um, drive this uh, in terms of again procurement and creating the markets and the certification and compliance well, this is something that many of you may have seen in social media recently um, plastic roads have been around for a long time uh, India has been at it for, for a number of years, as have Sweden and, and Scotland. And Jeffreys Bay is now saying, we're going to build a plastic road, which is fantastic. The fact that we're going to import that waste from Scotland to build a road in Jeffreys Bay is a little bit mind-blowing to me. Um, but the reality is, is that there are a lot of technologies out there that have proven very uh, unequivocally that, that um, plastics as an aggregate into a bitumen replacement are an extremely durable and useful component. And the jury is still out in terms of any leachate, but uh, from my perspective, as long as it's not in a landfill site or in the sea, it's got to be better in a road where it can be managed than it is anywhere else. So absolutely there are applications for uh, all of the different waste streams. But then what do we do with, with um, the bits that we can't use? Now the recycling market, one's got to understand, is um, very much a cherry picking environment. Um, and I think that's why um, the likes of PET are so successful. And it's because the value is there. So recyclers and collectors are getting anywhere between the guy on the street at 180 a kilogram to your um, middleman who's getting three to four rand a kilogram up to your granulators who are getting six to seven rand a kilogram. Uh, it has value, it therefore is uh, collected and creates opportunities in terms of conventional um, commercial applications. But there's a lot of plastic out there that doesn't get used. And uh, there is um, a number of, of different options in terms of what one can do. And the first one that I would like to uh, expand upon is, is energy recovery. Um, we can recover the energy on the plastics that we can't recycle. And again, there are some massive project uh, and, and uh, technologies available overseas, um, which are again, sort of large scale type projects, which are gonna cost you 30 to $40 million to implement. Um, and again, you know, the simple reality is that if we can't run a landfill site properly in this country, how are we going to run a uh, large-scale refractory so, or refinery? So we've done a, a number of things with uh, different project partners to create small-scale uh, systems. The picture at the top right is a 1,100-litre uh, reactor refinery unit that we've uh, um, established up in, in, uh, in Howick. And the bottom picture, uh, apologies for the, the gas bottle in the middle, but that is the small scale 800 litre um, pyrolysis unit that we are finalizing in, uh, in association with the Technology Innovation Agency. 
uh, to look at local development of uh, a product. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to create market opportunity for, um, for small-scale, affordable, high-return units that are going to create a usable fuel for local applications. So we've had every snake oil salesman coming through my doors trying to sell me the biggest and the best um, pyrolysis units, and, and most of the snake oil salesmen have been sent packing. But it is a good solution. So we've looked at developing local applications, and that certainly is something that we would uh, uh, drive um, for the developing countries, because logistics is what kills recycling. And if we can find a unit that we can place close to the source of where the material is, that is affordable and easy enough to use to create a product that is usable at source. That gives us a whole bunch of opportunities to be able to uh, unlock value in, in areas where people are then paid to collect waste and bring that to small localized processing centers where they end up with high value product, which can then either be transported as a high value product or used in situ. So if you look at it from an energy perspective, uh, Africa is energy poor. Africa and Asia are energy poor, but both are actually energy hungry. Let's put that into context. So South Africa has a production capacity of about 42,000 megawatts for a population of 55 million people. There's probably a few people guffawing at the moment because <clears throat> I think we're all a bit sensitive off the load shedding. And uh, although our capacity is 42,000 megawatts, I think we're running at about 28,000 megawatts at the moment. But to put that into context, Africa, the entire production of Africa is at 98,000 megawatts. So South Africa is almost half Africa's production. Nigeria, which has three, three and a half times our population, has only 4,000 megawatts production um, electrified in terms of their transmission grid. So everything runs on liquid fuels in, 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 uh, in Africa. If, if you go to Nigeria, you can't hear yourself think because every second corner is running a, a, a generator. Now, the simple reality is that as a, um, a, a crude oil producing country, they don't have refinery systems there and they're actually importing diesel to run generators. So the cost of doing business in Africa uh, or, or in Nigeria specifically is, is six to eight percent more than doing it anywhere else in the world because you have to provide your own energy. And generators are extremely expensive um, means of, of providing that, that, that electricity. However, they're all drowning in plastic waste. So it really was just a, a case of a saying, well, why don't we look at opportunities that are going to be able to valorize that waste, where people are able to then collect it. So instead of throwing it in the river, and then it goes away when the rains come, and it's somebody else's problem that they start to see the value in that product. And we start creating entrepreneurs dotted around the country, thousands of them, thousands of them employing hundreds of thousands of people collecting waste to produce fuels that are, are, are usable locally. Even in South Africa, we have a, a large industrial base that uses a lot of HFO or heavy fuel oil and light sulfur fuel oil um, uh, fuels in boilers, industrial boilers. Uh, and, and yet we're having to import um, some of these products and um, or manufacture them at high cost or pay a lot of money for them. I think anybody who, who has a, a large um, petrol tank diesel vehicle like I do will know that, that issue. Um, if we can create the value using the local waste, using local entrepreneurs to create a local product that will replace high cost uh, energy components, then absolutely we have a winning formula there. But then we need to understand the role of energy. Over 650 million people in Africa have no access to energy, and we're trying to achieve the sustainable development goals, and yet energy is the basis of all secondary development in Africa and Asia. We can't develop secondary recycling and materials beneficiation um, or manufacturing with regard to waste materials or any other materials. Food processing, um, not just processing, but even storage and, and uh, um, refrigeration are massive issues. And that's why we have massive um, uh, food um, security issues as well. Water management is critical. Energy is necessary. We've got to pump water from A to B. Uh, wastewater management, even more so. Communications, every one of your cell phone towers runs on electricity. Um, if you look at the cell phone towers in Nigeria, every single one has a generator at the bottom of it and a security guard because they're still the generators. 
So every single cell phone tower needs a generator and needs fuel that needs to be trucked in thousands of miles every day to go and fill up that generator and make sure that the cell phones run. Um, secondary education, industry, social infrastructure, you name it, without energy, the development of Africa and the growth of Africa is going to be stunted forever and we're always going to be stuck in the Stone Age and we need to become responsible for our own energy and our own management. But then there's a whole bunch of stuff that you just can't use, unfortunately. There's some really nasty plastic out there um, that uh, even a paralysis machine doesn't want to eat. And then we need to look at, at other applications. And here's another process that's being developed in, in Durban, which uses um, a number of different waste streams. So uh, this specific system you'll see there is a, is a grinder, granulator, extruder, a mixer, and blender. And this takes um, waste mixed contaminated dirty plastics and we mix that with uh, crushed glass. Um, so about 40% plastic, 30% uh, glass and 30% crushed rubble or mine tailings. And we're ending up with bricks, blocks, uh, curb stones, um, retaining blocks, these sort of products, which um, municipalities use by the millions. Um, so why can't we now create a system where we can develop the small scale unit that is safe, easy to use, that will create paving blocks, etc., and the municipalities then become the offtake market for those, those products. Um, the bottom right product is the, the M140 um, product that we've, we've um, just uh, put out there. And, and the, the, op the reality is that they're stronger than concrete, they're cheaper, uh, they're better, there's a whole bunch of different opportunities with them. So, you know, we should be driving this in terms of creating local entrepreneurs and local beneficiation. And that really is the way that I want to take this thing forward. So there is no such thing as waste. Everything has an application and an opportunity, but we need to get that before it gets into the sea. We've got to get that sorted out before it gets in there, because as soon as it then gets contaminated with, uh, um, with hydrocarbons and heavy metals and um, uh, barnacles and um, um, the necks of turtles and things like that, we need to be able to make sure that we can add value to that before it gets into the sea. So what we're doing here is that we're, we're, we're basically, we all understand marine plastics are a global crisis. The Sustainable Seas Trust and the African Marine Waste Network are working vigilantly, not only to raise awareness, but also to explore solutions and get the information out there about what they are. We understand that the bulk of marine plastics come from land-based sources and that most of this comes from the developing countries, but we know there are proven and viable solutions. So how do we take that to the next point? And my final slide really is about understanding, we keep talking about the sustainable development goals. <clears throat> and what we're saying is, is that working through the waste economy, we can see that the opportunity is, is that we can align 15 out of the 17 uh, sustainable development goals through unlocking opportunities and valorization in the waste economy. So that's really where we need to go. Um, sustainable solutions, not only possible, but economically viable. Africa needs to work for itself and create these solutions. That's it from me, thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, thank you so much for taking the time today as well just to present in our webinar series. Um, so I'm going to open up the floor then uh, to anyone who would like to ask Chris a question um, or perhaps just pose a discussion point um, for us all to chat about together. Just if you if you want to pose a question, you can type it in the chat or you can also uh, unmute yourself and, and speak. <laughs> um. Hi, this is Lauren. Um, can I go first? Um, yeah, Lauren from WWF. Um, it, it's great what can be done with waste, um, but to actually put that into to action. I mean, you were speaking about policies around construction material um, in order to absorb these new replacements. But um, you know, how does one? How does one? engage with government to get this going um, and yeah I, I just want to know because you say you haven't really got that far with DTI and SABS but I mean there I mean for policy and regulation we need something at that level as well in order to grow the demand for these for these products 
Lauren, that's a, a very valid question, and I think it, it's it's always been an issue. Um, I always talk about the the frustration that I have because I believe that every waste has a solution, but it's getting it into the market that's always the problem. However, I am really starting to feel a little bit more uh, positive about where the country is going and where the, what the, the the talk is is coming out from government. Um, they are speaking to industry for us to say to them, listen, we know what we need to do. Um, this is how we need to do it, but we need to get the blockages taken out of the way. So we're working with um, <clears throat> with the president's office at the moment to try and look at the Green Deeds program uh, and drive it through Green Deeds. Because if we look okay. at, at supply chain management, we can start getting a city. Say Durban says, right, we're now going to source all of our paving stones, curb stones, retaining blocks, um, etc., from community-based systems that are producing to a, a particular specification. Um, that literally, in 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 one fell swooping statement, would create hundreds and hundreds of jobs. And every municipality can do the same thing. So paving stones. And again, you know, we've got to look at, at, at the, the facts. The reality is, is that, uh, that the paving stones that we have are actually stronger than concrete. Um, yeah, they've, they've got a much better modulus of flexibility and the impact strength uh, outperforms concrete. So why aren't we using these sort of things with regards to um, our, our infrastructure? And, and government needs to play a vital role in driving the market. But government also needs to tackle the issue with certification and compliance because it yeah. is obstructive. And, and until they start changing the way they do that, we're going to have problems. Um, and that's where we are working. I think now um, Ramaphosa has ratified some of the outcomes with regards to Operation Pakisa for the chemicals and waste economy. And I'm, I'm really hopeful. I don't have much hair left to lose. So I'm really hopeful that, that this is going to be the final thing that's going to start driving these projects through. But Lauren, you and I know very well, you've got to keep knocking at that door and keep making it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, we have a question from Nicholas who typed it in the chat. Uh, Nicholas asked, does it have any harmful impacts in terms of plastic roads or plastic into roads and buildings? Uh, does it have any harmful impacts in terms of these plastic elements in the roads built in breaking down to microplastics and ultimately flowing into the ocean due to road abrasion and uh, yeah, stuff like that? And that's actually a question that we have in the SST office and sort of been throwing backwards and forwards as well. So I'd love to hear um, your, your input on that, Chris. Um, thanks, Nicholas. I, I think that, that um, it's an extremely valid question, and, and to be quite honest with you, you, you the, the jury is out on that at the moment. Um, there are two schools of thought. One is that um, there's the, the groups who say, absolutely not, it works perfectly, there's no um, uh, harmful impacts or anything else. That's just not possible. So what's going to happen is that the road surface will wear. There will be plastic that's going to come off of that, and it is going to create my microplastics. There, there's no ways that you can avoid that, and anybody who tells you differently is, uh, is, is, is trying to protect his own vested interests. The reality, however, is that we're, we're, we've got to try and compare apples and apples. And the simple reality is, is that um, Plastics locked up into a road infrastructure, which has been built properly with a proper drainage system and all the rest of it, will have a fraction of the impact um, that this would have had through landfill or, or getting into the environment. So I'm not saying that, that it is a 100% uh, guaranteed solution because it is still going to have slight problems, but it really is a case of choosing the lesser of two evils. Um, and, and that's the simple reality. The, 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 anybody who tells you it's absolutely fantastic and, and doesn't leach is uh, is going to be fabricating that to, to their own advantage. So, um, but yes, I'm a firm believer that it is a great application. Um, one's got to look at infrastructure. The simple reality is that if you look at, at conventional road construction, what you're offsetting is um, largely uh, aggregate 
mining that's normally coming out from either illegally mined products from our rivers or from mined and quarried stone. Now, if you look at the process of quarrying stone, the application there in terms of using nitrogen-based um, explosives and the impact of that on biodiversity, the environment, and the water table are probably worse than what would happen with um, the, the leach uh, or, or, or the, the, the product that you're going to get from, from a road. So it's not perfect, but you've got to put it into perspective. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, Nicholas says thank you so much uh, for the answer from you, Chris. Um, Shankari asks, in terms of turning soil waste into construction materials, it's an awesome idea, but what about the quality when compared to normal, normal materials? So when we look at building materials, the, the, the reality is, is that every single product um, that I've been involved with with regards to production and development using waste products has superseded all qualities and components of conventional infrastructure. Now the beauty is, is that you know what we're not going to try and do is we're not going to try and go out there and say we're going to produce an inferior product and try and palm it off on the poor people because you, you're, you're not even going to get out the starting gates. These products have got to be superior. And, and if you look at the, um, the, the materials that we're making from the waste plastic and, and glass, the compression strength outperforms concrete um, uh, by a factor of two. The impact strength outperforms concrete by a factor of five. The modulus of flexibility outperforms con uh, concrete, which I haven't quite defined yet, but I'm assuming it'll be three or four times more than concrete. So it is a val valuable and viable product. And the beauty is, is that when that product has reached its end of life, it can be ground up and regranulated back into another product. So one's got to look at circularity and end of life. Um, but absolutely, I believe that it is a, a, a direct opportunity. But if you contextualize what I was discussing, I was saying we we're looking at blocks, paving stones, lothal steins, that sort of thing. Um, and I specifically avoided application for structural applications. I'm looking at this stage at non-structural applications. The reason being, very simply, that the level of compliance and certification and registration and, and awareness and everything else in structural components and building a house out of this stuff is a little bit more complicated than, than we would like. Um, the reality is that um, we know that there are um, uh, coating systems that have been designed um, in the States and actually produced in Africa at the moment, where, which are spray-on applications that will meet any requirement for AAA fire rating and um, uh, uh, any other application that's required to meet and exceed conventional systems. So. Um, I would never advocate to build a block out of something that is not going to be better. Now, your standard M140 block or your ash block that builds most of our houses, I have a massive problem with that because it's built out of poor quality cement with a large portion of fly ash that leaches products into the environment. And those products are normally um, uh, inferior in terms of compression strength, which is why in Etiquini alone, we have 38,500 substandard houses that need to be demolished because of the poor blocks that are being used. Uh, so we're better, no doubt. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Chris. Um, I, I think you did answer, but uh, Stephen D. are also asking about the flammability of the bricks. Just quickly. So flammability, we actually have done a number of tests and it will meet an A2 fire rating as is. So literally we have done tests and poured petrol over these blocks and tried to set them alight. Um, ultimately, if you're going to be in a building and you're going to reach combustion uh, temperatures of uh, 700, 800 degrees or more, they will melt. Um, but at the same time, a concrete block would explode. So it doesn't quite meet um, a concrete um, fire retardancy level, but that's why the, the coating systems work. So something called Gigacrete, 
which is a five millimeter um, uh, cement creed product that's sprayed onto the surface, will make it as good as any other concrete block with regard to fire retardancy. Okay, perfect. Um, Shankari, I have seen your question and I, I will bring it up, but if, if it's all right, can we stick with the building material question, seeing as we're on this topic at the moment? Um, so Heidi Cox is asking uh, if these building materials are currently available to the public um, and they can and can they be found easily by home improvers or are they only available to contractors or tenders? Well, thanks once again to Heidi for putting me on the spot second time today. Um, the, again, we need to take these things to market uh, in a big scale. So what we're looking at at the moment is uh, tying in the opportunity in terms of the what we call the ocean brick or the green brick into corporate social responsibility. So companies um, like the Unilevers, Coca-Colas, Pepsis, etc., who have problematic waste streams um, and have rather substantial budgets in terms of corporate social responsibility would be able to look at supporting and promoting these types of products to get them into mainstream uh, markets and, and get distribution um, uh, at a level where anybody could pick them up from 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 anywhere. Um, but at the moment, no, you can't go to a build it. You certainly can't um, uh, nip across to to the local hardware store and pick them up. But that would be in the pipeline in terms of moving this thing forward. Um, if you look at like things like the ram brick, we showed you that the product made from earth. Again, not a product you can find in a hardware store because, again, it's designed around a technology that is um, destined to be at site uh, of the source of the material to produce the materials for local application. The opportunity around the blocks and bricks, what we're seeing with, um, with the ocean brick, is that we believe these will be distributed um, largely through municipal and, and corporate type structures. And ultimately, that would become available to the man in the street as well. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, I'm sorry, Shankari. If you don't mind, I'm going to push you again. <laughs> um, so, so Dan asks, with regard to the paving blocks, um, I'm sorry, boulders, rubble, glass, and plastics, what type of plastics have you used? Um, you mentioned those are the plastics not suitable for liquid fuels production. Can you elaborate on which types of plastics are suitable for which applications? Absolutely. So the the reality around pyrolysis is that, um, again, coming back to the snake oil salesman who will tell you, you can put any plastic into this machine and get diesel out the other end. Anybody who comes to your office and tells you that, just shoot them. It's going to save the world a lot of hassle. Um, the reality is um, simple chemistry 101, crap in, crap out. Um, so if you're looking at a high-grade fuel, you have to use a, um, a dry, clean polypropylene, uh, which will give you a high yield and a good quality diesel derivative. Um, if you are using uh, clean uh, poly olefins, particularly LD and HDPE, then that can be done the same thing, but then that needs catalysts to, um, to split the molecules into your higher fraction petrols and, and, and paraffins. So absolutely, one can manage it, but then as one goes down, there's lower and lower value products. Um, you certainly would not use PET uh, into pyrolysis uh, because it has a low, um, a low yield. You wouldn't use PVC because chlorides are nasty and kill people. Um, but then there's certain components that if you're looking at the, at the bricks and blocks, we've done a lot of tests on a lot of products. Uh, and that's the beauty is that if you look at the PET market, there's a huge volume of PET that is just unrecyclable, that the recyclers don't want, the colored plastics uh, uh, being a prime example of the contaminated plastics. PET, uh, we've done uh, literally everything through, through the block system, HDPE, LDPE, polystyrene. Um, but on top of that, we've also tested the likes of PET, polycarbonate, polyurethane, um, uh, ABS and other industrial plastics, and even a small amount of PVC. Um, I don't like using PVC anywhere because as soon as you heat PVC over 280 degrees, you release chlorides. Um, but the block system works at less than that. So one can use PVCs as well because you're not releasing the, 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 the halogens. 
Um, so it really is a case of choosing what you need to look at. The blocks and bricks, use the lowest value product that you can. Uh, pyrolysis, you can use pretty much any polyolefin, uh, but if you want the, the best yield, then use, uh, be choosy about what you put into it. So yeah, it's just a case of knowing your feedstock. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, then Stephen D on on the fire again. <laughs> what toxins what toxins are released as they melt or burn? Um, I assume the bricks. The fire ratings are designed to give time to get people out, and a flame retardant surface would certainly achieve that. But what about the firefighters and the people living downwind? A plastic fire burns very hot. Absolutely, and I think the, the, the issues around looking at the fire retardancy are, um, are complicated. And, and, and I've had many discussions with the uh, SABSs and, and, and Agamars of the world, where if your house is on fire, because um, we did this when we, we proved that we could, we could manufacture um, recycled composite plastic um, trusses and uh, battens and purlins. But we could never get them approved because they're saying if your house is on fire, you're going to have molten plastic dripping on you. Uh, absolutely. If your house is on fire and you've got a wood and concrete roof, um, that's going to fall on your head and kill you just as well. So the fumes are certainly an issue, and that's where obviously um, uh, plastic fumes uh, are going to be problematic um, at, at those sort of temperatures. When you look at self-ignition over 800 degrees, um, plastic is going to be a lot more toxic than, um, than anything else. Um, one of the reasons specifically we're looking at uh, avoidance uh, in terms of structural at the moment, we're looking at non-structural pavers, blopelsteins, etc. But then also I think if we went into the uh, construction market, I would not advocate for any, anything over a single story with a plastic brick. Um, there are other systems that we've got using mine tailings and fly ash with a geopolymer-based system that you can do multi-story with, which are far safer and a far higher fire rating. So, courses for courses, let's look at the right applications for the right, for the right product. Okay, great. Thanks so much. And then we're on to Shankari's question from earlier. Um, you talked about using the plastic waste before it goes into the oceans. Is there any way to turn plastic back into what it was originally, which is oil? Shankari, absolutely. So, um, what what this is what we call the nirvana, in, in, in essentially, in terms of, of this is the sort of thing that keeps me awake at night. Yes, you can convert it back to oil. Um, anybody can do that. I'll, I'll show you how to do it with two saucepans and a kettle at home. Um, it, it's dead easy. The issue is to convert that into a usable oil, um, but uh, that that's done through processing and uh, distillation and uh, uh, temperature and, and pressure distillation, where you can separate out the different components into naphtas, kerosenes, um, diesels, paraffins, uh, petrols, and then heavy oils and, and ashes. So uh, it certainly can be done. We're doing it right now, um, but the real circular economy dream that I have is um, depolymerization. So what you remember is plastics are made from uh, polymerization of a, uh, a carbon product uh, or a crude oil product. The, even if you look at the bioplastics, bioplastics or even, even those are made from a polymerization process. But the, the issue that I would love to see is to be able to homogenize and split um, uh, fuel molecules down to single uh, hydrocarbon chains, so CH1 to CH3. Um, if you think about petrols, petrols are, are longer chains, they're CH22 to CH28. Um, to then redesign and remanufacture plastics back from the plastics. That, to me, is what we need to achieve, and ultimately the goal that, that I believe would be the resolution to all plastic waste. Um, so then it doesn't matter whether it's a PVC or a polycarbonate or an ABS or an LDPE. You bring it back down to its basic molecules, and you then reignite that and then deep repolymerize that back into another plastic. 
but oil's easy. That's that's easy. I can show you that in a heartbeat. Um, achieving total circularity. That's that's what I dream about. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, then Josh. Hi, Josh. <laughs> Um, in Nigeria, we have a lot of multinational civil engineering companies who carry out a lot of construction jobs. How do we get these companies, and then he's put in brackets, Julius Berger, China Civil, Engineering, Construction Company, etc., to align their policy with the green agenda, especially as it is how, as it has to do with plastics? Wow, big question. Um, yeah, it's the same issue we're facing here, and it's a constant fight that I've had with the certification boards, the GBCSA and others, uh, in terms of looking at, at that, the fact that if we want to try and, and move towards a sustainable future, we need to think differently. We've got to stop protecting cements and concretes and clay bricks and high energy intensive, carbon intensive products that are going to uh, decimate the earth. We need to house a billion people across Africa and Asia in the next 30 to 40 years. And if we continue to do that with concrete and cement, the fact that you and I change our light bulbs and LED at home is certainly not going to save the planet. So we need to move from more passive design and architectural and engineering design to more active design, where we need to formulate uh, new um, standards and protocols around alternative building materials that are made from waste. Because I know for a fact that they meet all the requirements of conventional materials. So it's changing mindsets, um, and that's where we need to work together with the developers, with the architects, with the, the um, uh, um, agencies like your GBCSAs, your NHBRCs, et cetera, to actually bring everybody into alignment. If you look at, at the simple reality, we've actually got a system uh, at the moment, which um, we're developing, which if I had to tell you, I'd have to shoot you all, which is a bit difficult over the webinar, um, where we can use 90% um, recycled uh, waste from fly ash, mine tailings, and, uh, and glass, and other inert wastes, um, with zero cement to create a product that is 90% lower carbon footprint, 40% cheaper than cement and concrete, that, that, that exceeds the requirements of it. Uh, from a strength and impact perspective. So we know that the systems and, and opportunities are out there that will save money for developers. Now that's what's going to get them interested. If we're coming through with our single unit systems at around about 1,600 rand a square meter, your conventional at the moment is around about 3,500 rand a square meter. So we're less than half of conventional um, using waste products that outperform concrete. And it's, we need to just get it out there. The more systems we get into application, the more people get to learn about it and see the opportunities about saving money and doing the right thing and being sustainable, we'll create that market. But remember, we're fighting against a concrete, cement, and brick industry that's had 150 years to dig its heels in. And that's going to take a while to fight the way out. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much. Um, I can't see any other questions from the floor unless anyone would like to um, speak through their speaker. I have a question. Um, all the applications that Chris have, has mentioned are, are really great. I just wanted to know what are the steps for the way forward in order to implement those applications? And then looking at the plastic that's already in the environment, what are the steps to actually collect, what are the possible steps to actually collect that plastic so that we can start cleaning things up? I think that's Anne, I recognize the voice. Um, yeah, it's Anne. Absolutely, there, there, there are different steps we need to take. The, the first one that we're pushing at the moment is um, through what we're, we're getting a, a lot of um, uh, support now and, and a new mindset coming through with the Green Deeds program being pushed by, by the president um, to look at uh, unlocking alternative building technologies. The likes of NHBRC are pushing it. They've just created a whole new uh, innovative building technology database and uh, a forum network. Um, we need to drive through the unsuccessful routes of the past um, Zuma allocations like the 
the IPCC, the, the um, uh, what was it called again, PICC, Presidential Infrastructure Coordinating Committee, which basically did nothing over the last five years. Um, so it's about looking at unlocking the value, and that's what we believe from user's perspective uh, is, is the key to unlocking opportunities here. We're not going to go out there and, uh, and make the group fives um, come out of uh, liquidation, unfortunately. Um, what we are going to do is, is manage to set up thousands of units uh, across the country that are going to impact the lives of tens of thousands of entrepreneurs that will facilitate use and application from hundreds of thousands of collectors to provide products into those systems. But it's got to be driven by supply and demand. Um, so it, it, we need to get government to go, yes, we think it's a great idea because it solves the waste problem, it creates value, and, and, and it creates product. The stuff that's in the environment already, um, a lot of that stuff has been in the environment for a little bit too long. So you look at what's in the gyres. I know that there's a number of guys out there with the North Sea program trying to pull that stuff out. Uh, good luck to them. I don't know what to do with that stuff. I think you know, nothing short of incineration or gasification would be uh, useful for that sort of product. Um, old landfills, it's just too expensive at this stage to be able to mine out the old plastics and, and create products. So um, mining landfills is still the realm of waste to energy at this stage. Um, our landfill sites in this country are probably not possible because they've been so badly managed. Uh, the product would probably not be of any use in, in a waste energy system anyway. So um, I wish I could tell you I had the solutions for everything that was in the environment today. Uh, we're throwing another 8 million tons a year into the sea. Um, so uh, we've got to stop it getting into the sea. And, and then the stuff that's there, we need to collect it. We need to, somebody needs to show responsibility and the cost for picking that stuff up, get it out of the oceans, and then let's clean it up. And, and even if we just burn the damn stuff, we've got to find a way up to, to get it out of the environment. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, then Josh asks another question. Um, he says, as it concerns education, do you think practical and realistic syllabus should be drafted to reflect all academic levels, especially for civil engineering students in our tertiary institutions? Well done. Good question. I, I think that what's been taught at, at schools and all the rest of it at the moment is, uh, is, is, is really just far too limited in terms of being of any benefit to anybody whatsoever. We've got to focus on the valorization of waste. You know, the, the, the reality of us focusing on, on people's heartstrings to try and push things on environmental and sociological components is not working. It'll never work. Uh, you got to keep going back and drum it into people and educate people the whole time. Um, if someone's making a buck out of it, believe me, they'll change their story very quickly. But that's where we need to look at the valorization component, get that into the curriculum, get people to understand these are resources. There's no such thing as waste. Waste is resources we haven't used yet. It's as simple as that. We have solutions for every single waste stream, every single waste stream. Nothing should be going to landfill. Um, but people need to be educated as to what those uses are so that, that when the, the people coming through that, that secondary school tertiary then are, are then ending up as our leaders and decision makers in, in municipalities, they know what the solutions are. At the moment, we're, we're, we're dealing in, in a vacuum of knowledge, which is very difficult for municipalities to make decisions. So we need to get this information out to as many people as possible and, and, and change the way that people perceive waste. Perfect. Thanks so much. Um, I see we've run a little bit over time. So if it's all right with everyone, unless you have a really burning question, um, we do have a question from our office. Um, Nazi, Chris, <laughs> she asks, in South Africa, only a few plastic types can be recycled. On top of that, the majority of the collectors never benefit, benefit for, from this circular economy. So do we make plastic more expensive so it can be in demand? How do we really close the loop and make sure that everyone benefits? Nozzy, nice to hear from you. Good question. The, the issue really is, is that I'm, I'm of the firm belief that the plastics industry who are, who are spending 
billions in increasing the industry are really not uh, coming to the party in terms of any responsibility. Um, plastics should be more expensive. They should be have a higher value to increase their recyclability. But it doesn't matter, if, even if we do that, if we don't look at valorization of all the different waste components, the simple reality is we're going to continue in a cherry-picking society where the guys are going to get the high value stuff and leave everything else in the environment. We have to look at the solutions that are valorizing every single waste component. What are the opportunities? So, so when we look at things like the, the dirtiest of the dirtiest plastics, you can't do anything with it by itself. But you combine that with mine tailings and crushed glass and a bit of heat and a little bit of chemistry, you can make anything you want. Um, so what we want to try and do is push it from the perspective of looking at, at enterprise development. You get that message out there where we've got small-scale systems that small entrepreneurs in disseminated areas can add value to waste that's going to support local collectors and unpack that value chain from that perspective. That's the way we're going to do it. We cannot take on modern world or, or developed uh, countries' uh, applications because they simply won't work. Uh, our logistics costs and transport distances uh, will not make any of those worthwhile. But we need to look at small scale, we need to look at community-based entrepreneurial development, and that needs to be driven by creating the demand through responsibility from, from corporates and responsibility from supply chain through the, the, the public sector.